I do find these list of banned words just have me rolling on the floor in tears. But honestly, they have successfully made it almost unpublishable in mainstream newspapers to say slave. You have to say enslaved person, because otherwise we idiots are not going to be know that we're actually talking about a human being. They are starting to endanger whole classes of words that pertain to people. Pretty soon, we're not going to be able to talk about me as being a writer because I'm also a person. So I have to be a writing person <laughs> or a person who writes. Hello, good evening everybody and welcome to the Unheard Club um, event with Lionel Shriver. My name is Katie Law, I'm the books editor at Unheard and it's really wonderful to see such an um, incredibly full room, especially this evening. Um, thank you all so much for braving uh, the, against the tube strike and I know that's a testament to how much you must all want to come here, Lionel. Hello also, good evening to the uh, online viewers and we hope you'll enjoy the event even though you're not here in person. Um, I am going to introduce Lionel even though I think she doesn't really need very much introduction. Um, she of course became famous initially for her novel uh, to, in, written in 2005, uh, We Need to Talk About Kevin. Since then she has been making headlines for her novels, for her journalism, for her essays, almost always saying something a bit bolshy, a bit awkward, a bit not quite what everyone else thinks. And that's what we're going to be talking about this evening. Mainly, I want to talk to her about why it's not just okay, but it's absolutely crucial to keep on giving offence to keep saying things that other people don't agree with. And that's the subject that we're going to be talking about. Um, first, as a way into this, I'm going to ask Lionel about the subject of sensitivity readers. Um, Lionel, do you want to start by telling us what sensitivity readers are and what your views of them are? <laughs> I think they all know. <laughs> um, for the few of you who aren't familiar with the concept, sensitivity readers uh, started out uh, being hired mostly in young adult fiction, uh, which has been a genre that for some reason woke out earlier than anyone else. They were ahead of their time. And um, so uh, some authors have hired these people themselves, and more fr frequently, lately, it's the publisher who hires the sensitivity reader. And sometimes there are multiple sensitivity readers for the same manuscript. And the idea is that uh, these people ha are self-nominated experts on whatever category of humanity they happen to have been born into. <laughs> so. I'm a professional American and a professional white person. Um, and they're supposed to go through line by line and find anything in this book that could possibly offend anyone, especially their hallowed group. Uh, and unsurprisingly, uh, that results in a much more um, anodyne, boring manuscript. Uh, the, one of the ironies of the kind of offense that sensitivity readers are on the lookout is that basically you can't win because um, if you have a character do something that most people in that category wouldn't do, uh, then, then it's inauthentic. But if they do things that, that that category of people are renowned to do, then it's a stereotype. So basically, you're, you're done from the get-go. Uh, I should make it clear that no one at HarperCollins has yet had the nerve to subject me to these people. Um, 
And I object to the whole idea of it. Uh, there's nothing wrong with uh, being professional, being um, accurate uh, in your own terms. If, if the book you're writing uh, requires you to write people who are credibly uh, disabled or um, black or, or Muslim or what have you, uh, and, it's a re and it's a realistic piece of fiction, then you should probably do a little homework. But it shouldn't be against the law, you know, not to do your homework. Uh, if you've made uh, glaring errors, then it's, you know, the part of criticism and, and a responsible reader to notice. But uh, it's a very different thing from um, deciding to do a few interviews or a little reading on your own account and having your publisher uh, sick these self-nominated experts on your manuscript to tell you everything that's wrong with it and everything that has to go. And I know um, I, won't, I won't mention her by name because I don't have permission, but a very successful novelist I talked to recently uh, was subjected to multiple sensitivity readers, and they reduced her to tears. Um, the, the, the thing that, the reason that these, these people have come into being, especially from the publisher, is because the publishers are trying to protect themselves. So what few authors understand is that they don't actually have to take the advice of these interfering little people. <laughs> um, but m most authors think they do and therefore make these moronic changes. But what the, what the publisher is really doing is bringing in a layer of protection so that if it turns out that this book uh, gets it in the neck uh, it, it, on social media or in criticism, then they can say, well, you know, she didn't do what she was told. Um, and, and, and that's really what it's about at this point. How have these um, edicts affected you personally? Have you had any pushback from an agent or your own editors in, in your fiction writing to change characters, disapproval, and so on? I have been subjected to very little of that kind of interference, uh, but it's not foreign to me. Uh, one of the things that now, now makes people extremely nervous is the use of accents. Now, I don't, I don't generally like heavy-handed transliteration of accents in fiction anyway. It's a taste thing, but I, I, I think you can sometimes convey an accent with a few little touches that gives you the music of the way someone talks. And those little touches can be very useful in, in creating the character and, and the sound of the way that person talks. But even, even expressing the way people actually talk when, for example, English is not their first language, is now considered offensive. Um, and there are whole books, therefore, that would be you know, canceled uh, for this very reason. And I, um, a couple books back uh, in the Mandibles, there's a short dialogue with uh, African immigrants, and uh, I had used those little touches, and I had my British editor uh, say that that uh, that it was othering. <laughs> I find that word so repulsive. Um, and rather than take her head on, because I wanted to keep things cool, and she had restrained herself in relation to a lot of other things, I obliged, except that I did so in, in an underhanded way, so that there was a way of changing the dialogue so that you did get the accent, but I did it, I expressed it with whole legitimate English words, right? So you couldn't quite say, that it was transliterating and othering. Um, but I still got my way. And, um, and there was another instance where uh, I had just got myself into trouble with uh, objecting to cultural, the concept of cultural appropriation. And uh, was, was that at the Brisbane? Yes, it was. We, should we talk about that a little bit? Well, I'll tell my tiny story, and yeah. then we can, of course, yeah. get on to that. Yeah. Um, I had written a, a short story 
uh, in which uh, there was a girlfriend in, uh, of a white character who was black, and she, it's a very appealing character. Uh, she's smart, and and uh, although she uses some uh, black English uh, for the most part, she's very well spoken, and even her black English because she's upper middle class. I mean, her mother's rich, so no stereotype. Um, <laughs> And there are, there are reasons why this character was black. It, the, the, the story takes place in Atlanta. It's a huge upper middle class black population, so this was credible. But my agent suggested that I change this person to a white character because if we submitted the story, and it was to the New Yorker, um, <laughs> I, I roll, um, we would, and they rejected it, we would never know whether or not it was rejected because I was culturally appropriating or the story just sucked. <laughs> and I always allow for that possibility. And sure enough, it was rejected and I do not know whether or not it was because I culturally appropriated or the story sucked. Um, and that's the kind of incidental thing. But then I've, in some ways, I have some protection just because I have been, as you said, so bullshy. And that means they're a little afraid of me. That's really interesting. I mean, I, I think there is a sense that um, authors seem to sometimes apologize too quickly if they're accused of a particular misdemeanor. And I, I don't know if the audience recalls the case of Janine Cummings with her book, American Dirt, where she had a character in it. A, a main character was a Mexican um, Mexican woman who illegally immigrated into the States and she was hugely accused of cultural appropriation because she wasn't herself Mexican and um, she apologized yeah and Big afterwards mistake. she said that was the mistake and yeah. I think that, that, that this is um, this is a point that is often overlooked oh I have never apologized in public for anything as a matter of principle <laughs> And it is a big mistake, and there's no limit. Once you go down that road, you have lost the, the battle. That's, you have finished yourself. And the irony is that apologies don't even work. They're never accepted. You never apologize enough. Um, and you know, it's worth pointing out in this big picture issue is that where the real mistakes come and, and transparent cowardice is not so much on the authorial, but on the publishing level. So not only did the author not deal with that situation well, but she was ill-advised, and her publishers didn't back her up. And this is happening across the board. And as I wrote in a, a Spectator column uh, two or three columns ago, one of the reasons that publishing has become so timid and frightened and compliant and risk averse is because it's been taken over by women. I do not say that with any pride in my sex, but it's, it's women on the whole, and there are many exceptions. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, they err on the side of being fearful, and they also have, as a group, a fatal desire to please. And uh, what's needed in, in this circumstance is balls. And I don't care whether they're literal or figurative. <laughs> Well said. I, I, I think it's, um, it's very well said. Um, I, things that bubble up from that, um, I was going to ask you actually about specifically about women and publishing because you won a prize in 2005, the Orange Prize. It's now been renamed as the Women's, the Women's prize, prize. Which makes it even creepier. For, 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 so at the time, Two questions. At the time, did you think that there was a good reason to have a women-only prize? And today, do you think we still need a women-only uh, prize for fiction? I think at the time there was, there was some good reason for it. There was a real historical disparity 
in the award of especially the big prizes uh, for to, f women. I mean, they we just weren't getting acknowledged. And the irony is that long before the uh, major book buyers uh, all over the Anglosphere were women, you know, so it was a little odd. The trouble is that women will read anything by anybody. Kind of like sex. They say the same thing about sex. They're attracted to everything, <laughs> um, which I think is, is, speaks well for us. Um, and so, yes, there was, a, there was a place for it. Now, I was quite forthright, even at the time, uh, about the fact that if I had my druthers, I would prefer to have, to have won a prize that, that was open to both sexes. I, um, it would have meant more to me. Uh, I have no problem with uh, going head to head with men and I do not uh, feel that I need special protection. But it was at a rather low point in my career, and I would take what I could get. <laughs> um, and I, I, did, I have made a, a habit of not doing down the Orange Prize or the Women's Prize. Uh, and I figure, for the most part, it doesn't do any harm. Uh, it's just one more prize. That means that there are more people out there who have a little more money and a little more profile. Uh, but I do think that if you look at the statistics of who's being awarded what now, uh, if anything, we need a men's prize, right? <laughs> Women are taking most of the prizes. And furthermore, we now have a, a, a serious reverse discrimination situation whereby especially uh, debut authors, or, or at least authors who are not firmly established, simply cannot get into print if they are straight white males. And you know what? I think even the gay white males are starting to have trouble. <laughs> so, do you put that, again? Do you put that down to the number of women ru running publishing? I mean, do you think that they are wanting to push their own interests? It's partly a matter of fashion, you know, and, and uh, it's an ideological fashion. Publishing is utterly obsessed with diversity. And so, and that necessarily means that they are not um, choosing books uh, strictly on the basis of whether they're any good. Uh, diversity trumps excellence. And in fact, this is a huge society-wide problem, and it's not just publishing. We have ditched ec excellence and even competence, and all we care about is what category you belong to. And this way lies civilizational ruin, in my view. Um, but it, publishing, publishing is the worst of it, uh, and because women are slaves to fashion, including ideological fashion, and, um, and have this drive to please, and therefore regard talking about diversity all the time as pleasing, because that's what they gather is what you're supposed to do now. Yeah, part of the problem is, is to do with women. However, I do not think the problem is female readers. I sense no demand from the ground up uh, listen, stop foisting these male white writers on, on us. We only want to read books by people from Zimbabwe. Um, I just have, you know, I do a lot of events and I just don't hear it. Um, so this is not, this is not coming from the readership. Uh, the readership is interested in quality fiction. Yeah. The readership wants good stories and good characters, and also something with a little edge, which is where I come in. You do. Um, <laughs> you certainly do. I can't resist asking you, on the subject of the Women's Prize, what you think about um, the fact that Tori Peters, a trans woman, somewhat contentiously was nominated for the Women's Prize in 2021. There was a bit of an outcry about it. Um, I mean, 
she didn't win, but what are your thoughts about trans women entering women-only prizes? Well, I think it's obnoxious. Um, Again, is that more is that more pandering to the diversity? Of course, it's quota? more pandering. Uh, it's part of the a package of ideologies that we're now expected to subscribe to. So, if you're going to be inclusive, um, there is no such thing as the category of women, which is, you know, who belong to a particular sex. Uh, this is such a can of worms that we probably can't go very far into it. We'll have to have a different event. <laughs> well, I, I'd be happy. I'd be happy to organize that with you. Um, It'll be even more fun. As well as, yeah, as, well as um, this question about women in publishing, um, there's also, I think, a question about young staff and how my observation is that a lot of um, the management in publishing houses are terrified of their very young staff who are calling the shots and who are feeling offended, who are feeling unsafe, who are feeling uncomfortable um, about maybe it's JK Rowling's views on trans, uh, so they don't want to edit her children's books or whatever it happens to be. And um, is that something you've experienced? The, the, the youth, in, not just in publishing, I mean, in the wider world, I think it chimes with what you were just saying. Um, there is a sense, I have a sense of, of a lot of young people pushing a woke agenda and older people being really quite scared of it. Yes, which is bizarre because it's just a complete inversion of who has the power. I mean, we're dealing with an entire administrative class that, that doesn't realize that they're wearing Dorothy's shoes, right? They have the power. They can fire all these people. I mean, look at what happened at Netflix. That's how you deal with it. Maybe this isn't the right place for you. <laughs> That's what they told them. And they got sacked. There was a, they did a trim uh, after the Jave Chappelle brouhaha. <coughs> And the first people in the firing line were the people who had made a big stink about the Dave Chappelle comedy special. And that's the way it works. Uh, so that you're, there's just this complete failure to exert control that you, ha you have. You, you have the power. And uh, I'll tell you an interesting story. I hope Douglas Murray is cool with this. Um, but uh, Douglas recently changed publishing company from Bloomsbury to HarperCollins. Uh, and by the way, HarperCollins, in the big picture here, has acquitted itself quite well. They're your, your publisher. They're my publisher, and, and they have not given me a hard time, much less fired me. Uh, and they have been a refuge for a number of other authors who have fallen out with their publishers. But this particular instance of leaving Bloomsbury was interesting to me because of a twist. And that is, they were wrangling over the contractual details. They didn't actually want to lose Douglas, believe it or not. Um, but they threatened Douglas with their younger staff. <laughs> They used their younger staff as a tool and a weapon and said, you know, uh, you're lucky our younger staff uh, hasn't gone for you. And the younger, oh, oh, and the younger staff of all, all the other publishing companies wouldn't put up with you, so we're the only people who would have you. It's really underhanded, really creepy. And of course, this was a lie. Douglas didn't have any trouble finding someone else to publish him. He's very profitable. Well, I was going to say, it seems to me that there is a bit of a, um, a, a, an imbalance between profitability in uh, these companies and uh, the woke agenda, as it were, so that there was the case of Jordan Peterson. Um, I think his Canadian publishers discovered that a lot of their younger staff were bursting into tears um, <laughs> and threatening to, you know, have nervous breakdowns. And the, the, you know, one might have thought, oh dear, well, they will pander to, to all of this, as they did with several other 
um, authors and publishers. Um, but in fact, Jordan Peterson turns out to be extremely profitable. So guess what? Um, they would the, the crying mob were told to, you know, here are the hankies and <laughs> crack on. Um, so I, I do think I, 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 that there is something very cynical um, about, and it's not just in publishing, but it's in the wider uh, a wider arena as well about what I'm is, not what's sure going... I call it cynical. I mean, what I just described was cynical, and that's what made it interesting to me. Um, it was manipulative. Uh, it was using the current uh, political situation to get what they wanted in a, in a much more mercantile sense, not in an ideological sense. But uh, in the main, the problem is not cynicism. If commercial cynicism is all to the good because it's commercial, right? The real problem is in the elevation of these uh, ostensible values of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, whole organizations and corporations forget what they are for. And I have, I have written about this, and this is, again, this way beyond publishing. But we, that would lead us to talking about the 2018 instance in which I got myself into trouble. And that was when Penguin Random House uh, sent around to all the agents of their authors uh, this declaration that by 2025, they were going to have both their authors and their staff perfectly reflect the demographics of the United Kingdom. In, it's hard to say this without laughing. Um, in relation to sex, sexual preference, ethnicity, uh, uh, gender ID, uh, of course race, oh, and even um, class. Now that's a hell of an algorithm. <laughs> I thought it was hilarious, and um, and I wrote about it for the Spectator, and I and I thought um, I mean the main point of that column was that 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 companies and other organizations are forgetting what they're for, and the purpose of a publishing company is not to perfectly ref reflect the demography of whatever country it's selling books in, but to sell books. They're supposed to sell books. Surprise. Um, and somehow that column got twisted into meaning according to The Guardian. <laughs> They're so creative there. Um, that I thought only white people wrote good books. I was going to say, shall I? Um, I've actually got here, I think, what you wrote, just the sentence. Mm -hmm. Um, in response to this um, diversity mission statement from Penguin Random House. I think this is right, you'll correct me if it's not. If an agent submits a manuscript by a gay transgender Caribbean who dropped out of school at seven and powers around town on a mobility scooter, <laughs> it will be published whether or not it is incoherent tedious, meandering, and insensible. <laughs> yeah, that was the line. <laughs> and you got into a fair bit of trouble for all, for possibly some of the, some wrong reasons, as you've just, as you've well, just that said. Well, that line was endlessly quoted back to me as somehow terribly prejudiced. What's interesting about it is if you examine each element on its own, there are no pejoratives. There is nothing insulting in that line at all. Um, but it is in its composite, funny. <laughs> and that's a crime. Uh, and it's funny because uh, the first I knew there was anything amiss was I started getting emails uh, from people who I, I guess are on social media, uh, friends of mine asking if I was all right. <laughs> hmm. And then the um, and then the phone rang, and uh, it was this woman who had begged me to judge their inconsequential short story con contest. Uh, I hadn't wanted to do it. This was Miss Lexia. Miss Lexia. Uh, 
And, and she informed me that I had been stood down. I was so relieved. <laughs> and then she said, and you know why. I said, no, I didn't. <laughs> but I was happy to get out of it. Um, and uh, yes, it turns out that this particular line had been excerpted, and it was all over social, social media. Got me on the Today program. That was fun. But I was going to say you and and um, you you talked exactly um, on the Today program about what what you had meant when you wrote that and why you'd written it, um, but that didn't seem to cut the mustard with uh, De Debbie Taylor and Miss Lexia that that she felt that it was extremely offensive and would discourage women particularly and minorities from entering any kind of women's prize and a whole lot of stuff was was thrown at you and um, I think you defended yourself and acquitted yourself br brilliantly but I wonder how how these things affect you and whether you come away from it feeling bullshit or um, uncertain and whether you ever fear you've gone too far or you're going to get cancelled or somebody from HarperCollins is going to say actually Lionel no well, so far, I've got away with it. Uh, so I don't live in fear all the time. I realize that uh, the, the era we're living in is dangerous to me. And the irony being, however, that it's also been very useful to me. I mean, one of the reasons that you are here is not just that perhaps you like my novels, because they're entertaining or they tell a good story. But you're also here because I have stuck my neck out politically. And therefore, I have to say that in, that in the round, I have benefited from wokeness more than I have suffered from it. And that makes me rather gleeful. <laughs> And do you feel that you can harness it, as it were, for your next uh, novel? I your did. Next... I, I harnessed it for the, the novel that I have written, but ha it has not been published. And, there, and it has fed into some of my novels, I think, profitably. Uh, there's a... <laughs> I, did, I, I really broke the rules in The Motion of Body Through Space, which came out in 2020. And... Uh, one of the secondary characters is a, uh, an incompetent diversity hire. Um, <laughs> not supposed to do that. Um, and of course, yes, it, it was wildly criticized, um, and that made it really fun. Um, so it's been, and, and I think it contributes to, to that book. I mean, it's not, it, it gives it a subplot it is a major motivating, what happens with that character is a motiv major motivating factor for one of my characters who feels, who's been fired by this idiot. Um, so, you know, I find it artistically useful uh, and motivating. It, it also makes me feel like a more useful person in the world. I mean, I... I, I try not to have this be my sole and driving purpose because I am a novelist and, and there are dangers in um, getting so sucked into this uh, political standoff that I lose a certain artistic integrity. I don't want to become just an ideologue and I don't want to just write books that are uh, shadow boxing with the enemy. I I want to write books that would be interesting beyond this moronic era. Uh, so I have to watch it, and I don't I don't always want my novels to be focused on the culture wars, but I have used the culture wars, and more broadly. I have found the whole experience of the last several years informative, not necessarily in a cheerful manner. Um, it's been very discouraging in, in the same way that I find the whole COVID era incredibly discouraging, and I think less of humanity as a result. 
But uh, I find this time period illuminating in relation to any number of other political movements that I have known about in theory and read about or seen movies about, uh, but have not known in, in practice in, in real, real time. So that it, it illuminates the French Revolution and, um, and year zero in Cambodia and Maoism and Stalinism, the whole package of authoritarian movements, uh, which have not always been top down, but have sometimes been ground up and, um, and should be ground up, kind of, come to think of it. Um, <laughs> And to be present in real time while a movement is taking off like this and, and you almost universally taking over institutions and instituting an orthodox, orthodoxy, which if you do not hew to it, you lose your job, your livelihood. I mean, that is what's happening. I sometimes worry that it's petty and I shouldn't get that concerned with it. But... On reflection, I don't think it's petty. I think it's real. I think it's important. And it had better be peaking and go away because if it gets much worse, we're really talking about total dysfunction. And, and, and we're talking about countries just not working anymore. Yeah, I mean, I've, uh, it's an interesting way of putting it because I, I have often wondered, you know, is this something, is it, is it just in this small world is it just about publishing and literature, the arts? But it does seem to be spreading further and further out. And I wonder if it, it is a really, um, it, whether it is peak woke or, you know, where, where do you think this is going? I mean, do you think it's just going to get worse? Um, do you think you will keep writing about it? Well, I have no idea. Um, it depends on what ideas I get for books. Uh, I will probably feel called to keep writing about it so long as I am allowed, if this carries on. Uh, everyone I talk to wants to know whether or not it's started to subside. Are we prevailing in the argument? The real problem is that it has a life of its own because it has produced this entire class of people whose jobs rely on um, this DEI nonsense. And, and we are, you know, that, that theory of the overproduction of elites, uh, it, if you haven't encountered it, it's basically we're sending too many people to college, to university in British. Um, and, we're, uh, and we're graduating too many people in fields for whom there's little opportunity. There are not, not enough jobs. So we're, we've got too many fundamentally technically well-educated, or at least credentialed, um, which, and there's a big difference. Um, uh, and there are not enough jobs for them. And this DEI crap uh, it, it creates lots of little useless you know, sinecures, often very well paid, for these overproduced elites to fill. And they're going to cling to those positions for dear life. They're quite lucrative. And by the way, they pro proliferate themselves. Uh, uh, for the organizations involved or the companies, they're a terrible drain. But it, what, what's happening is that it's, uh, it, these whole layers of management are being maintained as, as a protection. It's a little bit like the sensitivity readers. You know, they don't cost that much. And, they, and, and look, you know, it's, it's good PR. L look at us. We have a whole department of 30 people who do absolutely nothing. <laughs> um, so I think there's a self-perpetuating aspect to this movement. And furthermore, the, the ideology which began in the universities is still being promoted in the universities. I mean, at places like Unheard, we may feel we're, we're winning the argument because the essays are so good. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're teaching unheard essays in university, uh, as they should do. So I am at least heartened that, that I have many more colleagues, especially in nonfiction. I'm sorry to say I don't have enough colleagues in fiction, but I do have many 
uh, colleagues in nonfiction who are standing up to this stuff and writing some very discerning uh, analysis of what's going on and where it came from. And that has been the most heartening aspect of the last decade is feeling that, that I have real fellow travelers, you know, genuine colleagues. And that's one of the reasons I write for this site uh, and, and others like it, like uh, Spiked or um, uh, Quillette is another example. They, they, they're, we too are proliferating. Uh, and, I, and I think our stuff is, is a lot smarter and a lot funnier. Um, but I don't, given that I also end up therefore living in something of a bubble where I read all this stuff, it takes up huge amounts of my time. Um, it's, it's easy to feel that you know, you're starting to get on top of this stuff that, that you're running the argument. But I'm afraid that none of the people who need to be persuaded are reading this stuff. It's a very atomized media situation. And the this, this same goes for my nonfiction. I mean, uh, I think there is a role to be played in preaching to the choir. The choir needs sermons, right? And, and we need to reach out to each other and to feel that we're not alone and that there are other people who are sane. And it, it makes you feel, in the current parlance, safe. Because <laughs> everyone is not crazy. And... Uh, and it gives us a, a sense of community, a much misused word. But this is a community. You know, you're actually physically here, and we are of like minds. And that we don't all agree on everything. That would be creepy. Uh, but uh, that's been one good thing to come out of this stuff. But dislodging these people, it's going to take a long time. I wonder if it's going to happen or how it's going to happen. I mean, it seems to me, you know, that there is often a sense that one is preaching to the converted. And as you say, you have the sense that um, you're, if you're with like-minded people, um, but it, it is pretty hard to go against um, this tide. As I said earlier, I, said, I had a sense that a lot of the, tar the, the woke tide is, is a youthful one. And... Um, this was something that was predicted as more of, of more people coming out of universities um, are, are going into the workplace, that then the t what is going to stop it? Well, it's been going on for a long time, so the problem is not only young people. And I, I have to say I feel a kind of funny mea culpa in relation to my own youth because... Um, I grew, I grew up at the tail end of the so-called 1960s, which in truth lasted well into at least the middle of the 1970s. And this is where a lot of the stuff was born. And by the way, as a kid, I bought into it hook, line, and sinker. I, you know, I would still oppose the Vietnam War if I could go back, and I still recycle. <laughs> um, but this, this whole... Um, Obsession with self-criticism, which has a, 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 an almost communist touch and feel, um, started back then. And I, I was very proud of being critical of the United States and being ashamed of the United States and being obsessed with all the terrible things we'd done wrong. And, you know, we think you know, pe people these days act as if we only started talking about slavery yesterday. No, we were obsessed with it in the 1960s, slavery and the, the genocide against the Indians. I mean, all the stuff that you, you hear harped on now, we, we harped on. And, and I internalized this stuff, and I was very proud of how ashamed I was. <laughs> well, that's what it is, right? When you're ashamed, you're superior because you know how terrible you are and everyone else is, is dri dribbling around in their ignorance. And, and they don't know how, how, what evil they hail from. Um, and I, that lasted, I would say, well into my young adulthood until I, I became a permanent expat. And I, and I admit e that even for the first few years of my expatriatism, um, that would have been when I was living in Belfast, uh, I, I, I still embraced the same shtick. Um, 
you know, I was ashamed of being American. I was a little self-conscious about opening my mouth uh, with my accent and giving away that I was from this terrible place. And honestly, I'm not quite sure what did it. Uh, maybe it was just living in Belfast where I realized there are other terrible places. Um, <laughs> and I, some, I, I finally grew up. And I grew up politically and I grew up personally. And I, I decided it wasn't a single point. But it wasn't you know, light from the heavens. But I came to resign myself to being American. I didn't choose to be born American. There are worse places to be from. And I was not responsible for slavery, right? I didn't kill any Indians. So everyone has to be from somewhere. And actually, that shame is perhaps the main thing that I should have felt ashamed for, because it is a false pride in being so illumined. And it's an empty pride. And frankly, from the outside, it is unattractive. We don't really like people who are ashamed of where they come from. It's a kind of betrayal. And, and, it's, and it's, it's a lie. It's as if you can repudiate that which cannot be repudiated. And it's, it's also a denial of, of fact, of physical reality. I was born in the United States in a little town called Gastonia in North Carolina. That is a fact, a fact. And I can't live it down. And for me to feel that I have to is, well, shame on me, right? So I came round on that one. But that, the reason I'm getting into this is that I'm testifying. This stuff goes way back. And this self-hatred stuff goes way back. This very Western-centered, oh, haven't we done terrible thing goes way back. And it's, it starts with my generation. The boomer generation brought this stuff to life. And so that it is, and those are the people who took over the universities. So it is not just a bunch of young people who got some stupid notion into their head. They got it from us. On that note, Lionel, thank you very much. So we've had an incredibly stimulating 45 minutes uh, listening to Lionel. And now she's going to take questions from you. And I think it, the best thing would be anyone who's got a question, just raise your hand and somebody will come to you with a mic and we'll just take one question at a time. So let's start with the gentleman at the front here. Yeah, hello. Thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, I was just interested in why you think um, Publishing did get taken over by women, women, as you say, or more dominated by women. Do you think this all and some of the the woke views, obviously, did it come from the the states, really? That the obviously with the big publishers being mainly based in the states and Penguin Random House, as an example, is a co huge conglomerate. So did that spread? Was it inevitable that it was going to spread from the U.S. to here? And then just to shoehorn another <laughs> question in. Which is related, really. Um, so books like the obvious ones, like um, the Satanic Verses, published in 1988. I mean, what are the chances, or do you think that sort of book would be published? <laughs> I think you've <laughs> answered. Published now. And another type of book, which is uh, thought was quite interesting. The there's a series of books called The Number One Ladies Detective Agency, which is beautifully written, <laughs> beautifully written by. Uh, an elderly Scottish uh, professor, Alexander McCall Smith. Yeah, uh, but, but he the whole book is written from the perspective of a um, precious pre I've forgotten the surname now. Precious more what sort of thing a, as a black woman. So what are the you know if you just like to comment on that? Thanks. Well, funnily enough, I um, I had a conversation with somebody at Harper Collins in the upper levels of Harper Collins, and. Um, he was bemoaning the fact that, and they publish Alexander McCall Smith, that he's quite certain that if one of those books came in today, they would not publish it. And that's Harper Collins, right? The refuge, the, the truth is that the, the, Harper, the Harper Collins CEO is a Brexit supporter, right? Very conservative. And that helps explain why Harper Collins is a bit of a, an island politically. 
but even they would probably turn down the number one ladies detective industry agency. I haven't read it. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, they wouldn't publish it today because it's an older Scottish white writer uh, with a main character who is female, black, and African, which is from my perspective, I, you know, I find that admirable. It's an extension of imagination, of empathy, uh, it, you know, I'm far more interested in reading that book than, than it, it, I would be if it's about a, you know, a barely disguised older white Scottish male who happens to be the main character and writes novels for a living. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so, yeah, there are a lot of books that, great books with huge followings that if you embrace the current ideology would not be published today. And much less uh, rusty because um, the tippy toe around Muslim sensibilities is extraordinary because it's not just you're afraid of offending them, you're afraid of their blowing you up. That's real fear, and uh, and I'm afraid that brought, that 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 on a cultural level, terrorism has been effective. Right? We're afraid of them, for good reason. Don't step on those people's toes, and so that when a an autistic kid drops a Koran by accident, then it's a national incident, and. Um, and the, and 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 the kid is under arrest for blasphemy. I, it's I, it's just extraordinary. So this is what I'm talking about. You know, we, toward the end of the talk, we discussed, you know, whether this is important. Well, this is important. Now, what was your first question? Well, this question from the U.S. to uh, the U.K. Was that inevitable because publishing conglomerates are mainly? Or a lot of them. I am not convinced that the problem of uh, this contagion spreading from the United States to the UK has to do with expressly with corporate links. I mean, yes, they do have corporate links, but more importantly, there is this steady um, current across the Atlantic, and it only goes one direction. And uh, I don't think it speaks well for British culture. I'm embarrassed for you. Or us. I'm not quite sure how to put it. I'm very confused by pronouns these days. <laughs> and, and not in the contemporary sense. Um, there's a slavish adoption of American trends here. And, uh, and we see that in the universities here. And therefore, we also see it in the publishing companies. Now, that there, there are institutional links between the big companies, but the problem is a cultural contagion and not a corporate one. Thank you so much for this evening. It's been awesome. Um, you said a while back that the best way to fight this war on language or on words was to either ignore it or to laugh at it. Do you still think that? or as we see it getting more and more serious, more and more consequential, do you think there are things that we can action or things that need to be done rather than just letting it happen in the background? Well, if we're talking about um, policies of hiring and letting people in universities and everything, which are now being completely dominated by manic affirmative action, um, yeah, you do have to fight it. I think w my remarks probably pertained to the obsession, the left-wing obsession with language. And that's a hard one because, yes, my tendency is to laugh at it. I find uh, these lists of words we're no longer supposed to use, which get longer and longer, I find them hilarious. Um, you know, you can't refer to a field of study anymore because it's going to remind, pe remind people of slavery. 
you literally could not make this stuff up. I mean, it's, it is beyond satire. It, it, these people are doing our work for us <laughs> in making a mockery of themselves. The trouble is that it does start trickling down. I mean, the um, Associated Press guidelines just issued, and this used to be, you know, a kind of Bible for journalists, right? That, that, that you, you buy into the AP style and they have certain rules of what you do. And that's a standard that is observed largely across the industry. But now they've said that you can't use the word the. <laughs> now, obviously, it's in a certain context, but honestly, they are banning articles. Um, you can't say the disabled because it defines a person in terms of a particular aspect of themselves. It's kind of hard to follow. Um, but they even said you couldn't say the French. <laughs> After which, the French got really pissed off. <laughs> um, but for this lunacy to have filtered down to even the AP style book means that it's a little more serious than I would like it to be. I would like us to be able to laugh it off. I do find these lists of banned words just have me rolling on the floor in tears. Um, but honestly, they have successfully made it almost unpublishable in mainstream newspapers to say slave. You have to say enslaved person, because otherwise, we idiots are not going to be know that we're actually talking about a human being. They have they are starting to endanger whole classes of words that pertain to people. Pretty soon, we're not going to be able to talk about me as being a writer because I'm also a person. So I have to be a writing person <laughs> or a person who writes. Now, it's. It's dumber than dumb, but at the same time, it is starting to have an impact on what is considered acceptable use of language. And my, my biggest sense of upset about all of this stuff, when, and again, we're talking about the linguistic stuff, is that I just hate bad writing. I hate the mangling of language. I hate stupid use of words, and that's what they're promoting. I mean, they honestly have people on the news saying, people living with obesity. <laughs> and again, this is funny, but there's another level on which it is more insidious. And all these things we're no longer supposed to say have to do with a denial of reality. A lot of the censorship in relation to Roald Dahl for example. And also, I gather there's another series called Goosebumps. I haven't read it. Um, it is for children. Which is removing the word fat and sometimes even removing any reference to black or other colors. It's getting super weird. I mean, First off, no matter how much reference to the word fat you eliminate, it doesn't change the fact that being massively overweight is bad for you. It also doesn't change the fact that most people do not find being massively overweight attractive. <laughs> so it's as if you, if you eliminate the word, you eliminate the prejudice against that state. And by the way, that's a healthy prejudice. We don't want to encourage everyone to be massively fat. If anything else, it's a misappropriation of calories. <laughs> but what, what is behind this stuff is a lie. So this is why it's important. It is the promotion of lies that you can eliminate. You can effectively eliminate fat by eliminating the word. You can re eliminate the reality of the fact that it is physically bad for you. 
by not saying anything about it or by removing the person from obesity, the person living with obesity, as if it's a flatmate down the hall. <laughs> so I don't think we should stop finding it funny, but we do also have to t take it seriously. I use the word slave at every opportunity. <laughs> I'm going to be really greedy and ask two questions. Quick. Okay, really quick. Um, three weeks ago, I was here. I was here for a debate around transhumanism, which suggested that the woke stuff is actually coming very high down from transhumanist agendas. You know, I don't, I don't think anything can come high down. <laughs> okay, I was. That was the question. So you've answered it. And um, the other question was that um, I didn't get the question. Well, the question was what about actually, transhumanism? Uh, how do we, if this, if this, um, the, tra the trans um, ideology and some of the woke ideologies relate to technology and how technology is changing us? Can fiction, can fiction engage and interrogate with that? Because it's such a big. Uh, it's such a big concept. I, I have to believe. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, yeah, it's one of the things fiction's good for. And if anyone can do it, you can do it. <laughs> Thank you. And the second question was: I was just aware that two months ago, Constant Constant Kissin was able to win the Cambridge Union debate by uh, with a whole bunch of woke students by engaging with them in terms of um, issues that mattered to them, like climate change. And I just wonder if you think, Lionel, whether there's any way of really engaging with a lost generation of people who are completely captured by you know weird w weird ideologies is there any way of reaching people that's my question i don't know i mean i'm not in the university world and uh fortunately i don't have to confront people who have swallowed this ide ideology whole very often one of the problems with the ideology is the way it seals itself off so that part of the ideology is a refusal to have a conversation. That you, that it, it is, it is, it causes you harm to talk to somebody or listen to somebody with whom you disagree. And that, that's the ultimate bubble. So you, you cancel everyone that you don't want to listen to or who has a different perspective. And I mean, it's anti-education, which I, I find it incredibly ironic that this stuff originates in universities, <laughs> because it's it's the it's the antithesis of what real education is. Uh, I think parents may have a role to play. Again, I'm not a parent, but uh, I wouldn't give up on trying to talk to your kids. And I mean, one, of, one of the things that dismays me is that a lot of the parents believe the same stuff, right? And so the, the kids, this is apropos of our, the end of our conversation, the kids are not entirely against the parents. What, what dismays me about younger people these days is why they don't rebel. This stuff is coming top down. This is what they're being told. This is what a lot of their parents believe. It's not rebellion. It's anything but. It's conformity, total conformity. <coughs> and you, you hear from a lot of, you know, not even conservative students, but just centrist students or slightly right of center students. They all keep their mouths shut. They're terrified. <laughs> now, what is wrong with young people who don't tell the adults that they're full of shit? <laughs> but that's what we were like. I mean, I bought into my parents' liberal ideology, but I, I grew up and I overthrew it and started thinking for myself. And, and I, my first experience of asserting myself was overthrowing my parents' Presbyterianism. I mean, but my, both my parents were professionally religious, and I instinctively didn't buy it. Now, it turns out everyone else turn, is the same way now, so it doesn't seem especially interesting, but it was, it was risky in my family. 
to say, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't want to go to church anymore. I don't believe this. And it gave me practice for later when I realized that I didn't entirely buy their political ideology. I became an independent intellectual being. What is wrong with younger people that they don't go through that process? It's, it is empowering, as we used to say. It is exciting. And it, it, it's fundamentally Oedipal. I mean, it's, it is overthrowing the previous generation and asserting yourself and growing into yourself and deciding that you are capable and that you, you can think for yourself, why is this generation, and even to some degree the previous one, not going through that rebellion and that self-assertion? And I'm afraid that a lot of the self-assertion we do see is an assertion of weakness, you know, so-called vulnerability, mental illness, feeling unsafe. You know, it's all soft. I would like to see a little strength. So yeah. to, today I found myself being uh, uh, one of these uh, sensitivity readers, and uh, I was editing something I usually write, and uh, uh, advised somebody to remove something because he was calling uh, disabled able people to be blessed, implying that disabled people are not blessed. And uh, it was not really. But I felt bad because um, it, it was, at what point does this become a, a protection from distraction? Because it was a non-woke kind of thing. And at what point becomes self-censorship? in a way that we should just keep doing it because otherwise nothing is gonna change. But then there are people like Coleman that also acknowledge that there are some things he's not gonna talk about because of those kind of issues and not to make sure that it depicts the right battle. So what is non uh, self-censorship and where is that we should actually charge ahead? I don't think there's any formula. Um, there is such a thing as being edited well and uh, I do have uh, my editor occasionally call attention to something that that's going to alienate people, and it doesn't it, it doesn't get you anything, right. right? So I don't mind having that called to my attention. You know, I've been a little careless, or I wrote something in such a way that it could be interpreted in a way that I don't want it to be interpreted. So if you've got a line that seems uh, to be dissing anyone with a disability, then, and that's not what you're trying to convey, then, then you should fix it. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I don't believe in gratuitous offense. Um, I sometimes offend on purpose. <laughs> But there's nothing wrong with having another perspective, and I'm always willing to listen. So if someone can, can make a good case that I should cut a line or change a word or, you know, whatever, I'll listen to it, and I'll entertain it. And sometimes I'll reject it, but sometimes they're right. So there's, there's, no, there's no pat answer to that. Uh, there's always a danger of becoming so dogmatic in the service of anti-dogmatism that you close yourself off to information that, that actually is very useful to you. So I sometimes have to watch that myself. I recently read one of your novels and, and very much enjoyed it. I confess to not having read any of your journalism, so I, I came here this evening perhaps ill-informed. Which book was it? Um, the Motion of Through Space. I can't remember. Yeah. Um, so listening to you, I agree with a number of your points. I also strongly disagree with a number of the things you've said. And I can live with that. Yeah, which I'm sure you wouldn't be unhappy about. But um, I'm left with a feeling of even that this is an era of even greater polarization than I have perhaps thought, or it has, it has stressed that. And, and perhaps what we're missing is, is more of a voice for the, the centre ground and the middle ground. And I wonder if, to get through the era, it's that... It's that got us here as the centre-ground. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if that voice might be better heard rather than the, 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 two, the, the two polars fighting each other quite similar. Well, I'm afraid that um, the centre-ground is now interpreted as right-wing. 
Now, nothing I've said uh, 30 years ago would have been faintly controversial, and now it is. And it's funny, I was just speaking with another audience member who said that uh, she's from my same generation, and she started out a, um, a liberal. And she hasn't changed any of her opinions, and now she's regarded as right wing, right? And that's, that's what's happened to me. Uh, I, so the irony of the position I find myself in is that I think that for the most part, most of my positions that I advocate are expressing the views of the majority of the population. And the views of the majority of the population are no longer acceptable. And that bothers me. So it shouldn't be brave to say most of the stuff I say. And unfortunately, it has become so. On that note, thank you very much.